Well, good evening, everybody. Good to have you tonight. Starting right on time. How about that? Yeah, ready or not, here we come. It's good to have you and appreciate you being here on Wednesday night. Man, I sound like I'm, I'm really got a lot of power tonight. What, what is this? You know, I, I like it. You, know, you turning me down? You turning me up? You're leaving me alone. Whatever he's doing back there, he's doing it. Anyway, good to have you tonight and uh, excited about tonight's message. And we're going to continue on in our study we've been doing on, uh, on Christian character. And um, it doesn't mean that you're going to become a character, okay? Um, most of you already are. But uh, hopefully you'll put some Christian in your character. That's what it's all about. So anyway, that's supposed to be a joke. Anyway, forget that. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll have a word of prayer and we'll get started tonight. Our gracious Lord and our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time you've given us, Lord, to come and to, in the middle part of the week to hear of your word. Lord, we pray that we would have attentive ears. Lord, we pray that you'd listen to what you would have to share with us here this evening. Lord, we've got needy hearts. Lord, it's a, uh, it's a really, really dry world out there. And Lord, it's like a, uh, like a desert sometimes, uh, especially spiritually. And Lord, we need refilling. Some of us have... Uh, have really taken some some hits this week already, Lord, and we know that Satan's against us. And Lord, we just pray that this will be a time of um, just refreshing, Lord, at, at your oasis here this evening. Lord, we ask that your blessings be upon also Pastor Brian as he's in the back with the discipleship group. And Lord, and the kids tonight, the students, everything that's going on on this campus, we pray that you just be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and get right on in. We're going to be talking tonight about some principles of being dependent, not dependent upon ourselves, but dependent upon the Lord, and you can follow along on your, on your notes that you've got there. First point says, we need to learn to follow the leader. We need to learn to follow the leader. I don't know if your upbringing was like mine, but... I can remember, I, was, I loved to play sports when I was growing up, and uh, loved to play right on in through high school and everything like that. I was a sports nut. I played baseball. I was a, I was a catcher for a little league and, and senior league and high school all the way on up through. Um, I was, played football. I was on the track team, through shot put in the discus, and I was on a wrestling team. I did a lot of stuff. Anyway, but... I can remember that when we played sandlot ball, remember out there on the field, we always had to choose two captains because there was always two teams. And I can remember that more times than not, I was a captain. And more times than not, my best friend of 50-some years, he was usually a captain, unless we wanted to be on the same team and then we gave the honor to somebody else. But it, that's just usually how it felt. But until that time, until we just were nominated the captains, I remember there was always a big deal. Like, I want to be captain. No, I want to be captain. No, I want to be captain. And I've come to figure out that most people, they don't like to be anything else but the leader. They like to be the leader. Now, as you get a little bit older, sometimes you want to, you know, not be the leader. But when you're a kid, if you're headstrong, especially like I was, you want to always be the leader. You don't want to follow anything. So we still have that same problem sometimes as, as adults. And we say to the Lord sometimes, we want to be the leader. Now, we may not shout that out to him. We may not put it on a sign and say it, put it up to him and say, I want to be a leader. But we show him that we want to be the leader by our actions. When we act independently of the Lord, when we go different than his word and his directions of things he wants us to do, if we don't listen to the directions that he's sharing with us, what we are saying to him in essence is, I know the way to get there. I don't need your help. I don't need any of this. I am a big boy. I'm a big girl. I know how to do this, okay? I've been a Christian for a long time. Thank you, Lord, but, you know, after all, I'm mature. I've arrived. I can handle this. Well, let me tell you something. 
You don't want to be that kind of Christian. You don't want to ever think that you have arrived. I was sharing with Brian just the other day at lunch. I was saying, you know, it's amazing that, you know, I've been at this for a long time. And uh, somebody said to me, you know, one of the funeral writers said to me a lot long ago, they said, you know, this must be old hat to you. Well, it's not old hat, old hat to me. You know, God gives me something different all the time. You know, it gives me something different all the time. Um, just in the case of point with, with Monday, I told you that I had a very, very difficult funeral uh, that was coming up on Monday afternoon. It was, it was terrible. I mean, the young man that I did the service for, he, he was murdered. He was shot over 30 times. Um, just a really, really tough, tough service. And, um, you know, I've done services before, people that have been murdered, suicides, or accidents, and all that kind of thing. I, I've done that. But it's been a long time since I had have done one of this magnitude. And I just was really pouring my heart out before the Lord because I knew that there were going to be people there that were of the gang persuasion, a lot of people that were there. I also knew, you know, there was, there was police that were there. There were people that were guarding. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of different things going on, a lot of different dynamics, as you can imagine. And um, so I just was really prayerful. I said, Lord, you know, um, I think, you know, as far as I know, this young man was a Christian. I don't know. I mean, I go by what people tell me, you know. Uh, try to find out his aunt said that he was. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not God. But anyway, um, she said, Pastor, um, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give it to him. And I want you to give it to him hard. And I want you to give it to him straight. Pastor, I don't want you to pull any punches. I want you just to let it go. And I said, Yes, ma'am. She was a Christian, and she knew where the road of her um, her um, ne nephew, yes, excuse me, her nephew, had. The, she knew the road that he w went on in the last year of his life and, and some of the, you know, friends and things that, that he had taken on and everything, and, and she just said, you've got an audience, an unbelievable audience, so... I got there service early, taught the funeral director, and he said, well, he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to let it fly. And he looked at me, and he said, you're going to do what? I said, I'm going to let it fly. I said, the aunt wanted me to, to really let it go and let it fly. So what I'm trying to say to you is I got really super, super, like I always try to do, but even a little bit more so on Monday, I try to get super, super dependent upon the Lord. Because I said, Lord, you know, I just, I just don't have the right words for this. I just need your help. And it took me a lot longer uh, probably to prepare for that service than it had, in, you know, for services that I've done in a long, long time. And um, I, I, I didn't treat this like old hat. I treated it like something that I needed to be completely dependent on. And the Lord really blessed me. He really, really blessed me. I mean... I had complete freedom in that service, and I will tell you that those kids that were there, there were a bunch of them, that place was packed, um, they listened. I mean, they listened. I didn't have one single person other than two kids that got up and left, but the other ones, they stayed. They were respectful. They listened. You know, they, they, they gave me the privilege of being able to talk to them and talk to them straight. Talk to them about Jesus. Talk to them about salvation. Talk to them about choices in life and, you know, the element that's out there today. So, you know, I, I, I let it go. And uh, I walked out of there, and uh, the funeral director said, you weren't kidding. You really let it go. And I said, he said, but I'll tell you one thing. He said, they need to hear everything that you said. Amen. So, you know, praise the Lord for that. A little off track there. But we need to follow the leader. I want to say there's two ways to, uh, if you are coming to my house, there's two ways that you can get there. One way is to, for me just to give you uh, my address and for me to say, okay, you plug it in in your GPS and you come to my house. So what would you have to do if I said that to you? Well, you would have to look at, that used to be, you'd have to look at a map. Maps are outdated, you can't find a map hardly anymore. But you have GPS, you know, you, you ask your whatever it is in your truck or car, and they send you to wherever you're going. Hopefully that'll be right. 
But if you follow those directions, hopefully you'll get to my house, okay? But you think about that in life. That's a picture of kind of walking in the flesh, and I'll get there in just a second of where I'm going in all this. But you follow the instructions of life, and then you, your success is predicated upon your ability to execute the plan, all right? All of us have plans in life. When you go to work at a place, they give you a plan. They give you a way to be successful in the job that you're in. So what do you do when you follow the plan? You follow the plan that they tell you to follow, and your success is based on your execution of that plan. You say, well, Pastor, where are you going? Get on down to the next point. It says, character is a byproduct of dependency. I said there's two ways to get to my house. One of them is following the GPS that I give to you, but the second way is better. The second way is this, that you follow me to my house. When you follow me to my house, I know where I'm going, hopefully. I know where my destination is, and when you follow me to my house, guess what? You don't have to rely on your GPS. You're relying on me because that's my house. So your percentage of arrival at my house, if you follow me, is going to be 100%. If I was in some wacky place, like I was following some direction sometime, I remember about a year ago, I was trying to go to a, a bluegrass festival. And the old boy said to me, he says, I'll tell you what there, Pastor. He said, if you're following that there GPS, he said, uh, it won't lead you to my house. It'll put you way on over here, yonder, over here somewhere. I mean, that GPS didn't even know where he was. So he said, what I'm going to do, he says, is you let me know, and we're going to put this big old thing out from my house. It's going to have a thing pointing this way. And that'll be it. So my way of getting to his house was me following him. If I followed the GPS, I would have never gotten there. So what does this have to do with anything, Pastor? If God, is, if God tells us to follow him, we better be following him. And if God was to tell us, you know, give us a list of do's and don'ts, he would have said, here's a map, and get there the best way that you can, and I'll see you at my house. That's not what God tells us. God, yes, he gives us the Bible. Yes, he gives us the word of God. But who is the person that leads us into all truth? Who is the person that reveals to us what the word of God should be saying to us? Yes, the word of God is a map. But we have to let the Lord lead us in that map. We've got to be dependent upon him. The only way to get to where God wants us to be is for us to be totally dependent upon him and let him be the one that we are following. When we say in our hearts or in our actions that we are the leader, that we are following us as a leader, we're in trouble, folks. We're absolutely in trouble because we think we know where we're going but we don't know where we're going. We have no idea where we're going, all right? Hey, we've been there. We've done that. The Lord says, listen, I don't want you to follow your own instincts or what you think is right. You better get the leader thing right. And I know we say, well, pastor, certainly. I'm going to ask the Lord about every day. You know, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow him. No, listen, it's something that you and I have to determine to do Every minute of every day. Because what Satan wants us to do in a subtle way is he doesn't want us to consult the Lord about our directions and our decisions in life. He doesn't want that. Why? Because he wants me and you to get off track in life. How does he do that? He does that through initiating or trying to get us to be prideful to say, hey, I'm a veteran at this. I know what I'm doing. And we don't consult him. What does that mean? That means that we need to make a conscious effort of saying to let the Lord direct our paths in all ways, 
Acknowledge him in all ways. Acknowledge him in everything, in all decisions, the big decisions, the small decisions, the decisions in the middle. Always acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. He is amazing at showing us where there is road construction and things going on in our life that we don't see or potholes until we're right up on top of them. Amen? Amen. Folks, listen, I'm telling you, he's the bright beams. You ever use bright beams? You ever been driving down at night and, and you just something tells you to flip on the high beams, you flip on the high beams, and you see something in front of you that you wouldn't have seen? If you hadn't had your high beams on, last time I was coming out of Georgia, North Georgia, we were coming out of there at 4 o'clock in the morning. I know I know better, all right? I've done North Georgia at 4 o'clock in the morning. You know what comes out at 4 o'clock in the morning in North Georgia? Deer. Deer. You better believe it. So, and bears, yeah. Scraped a bear one time. But listen, coming out of North Georgia, I had my, I was going along, I didn't have my high beams on. And I remember, I said, hey, I better cut my high beams on. I had those high beams on no more than five minutes. And I called a deer right out there in front of me. Had I not had my high beams on, I would have smashed that deer. All right? I wouldn't have stopped to pick him up and make mistakes either. But, you know, it would have, have messed me up. And I would have killed the deer more than likely. But, hey, I want the Lord to be my high beams. I want the Lord to show me things that are in front of me, and he can only do that if I ask him. He's not going to show you if you don't ask him. You know why? Because he wants you to learn to turn on your high beams. Right? Right. Okay? That's what he wants. He says, listen, if you want me to be the leader, you're going to have to ask me. I'm going to wait. I'm going to be right here on the sidelines, and I'm not going to be the leader unless you ask me to be the leader. And he's, he does that because he wants us to know that pride comes before a fall. The one thing that's, that God hates, and it's in the word, he hates. He uses the word hate. That's a strong word. I hate pride. He hates it. He hates any semblance of it in our life. Why? When we are prideful, we are saying, in other words, get out of the way I've got this. And believe me, if that's going to be your attitude and my attitude, and it has been my attitude sometimes, and if you're honest, it's been your attitude sometimes, listen, here's what God's done. He's crossed his arms. He said, go for it. He knows what's going to happen. He knows. He lets us crash, and he lets us burn. He does. You know why? So that we can learn our lessons in life. Amen. Sometimes we did that with our kids, didn't we? Raising our kids. How many times did your kids tell you when they got to be, oh, I don't know, teenagers or something like that, they've arrived, <laughs> right? 13, 14 years old, they know everything. I mean, we're a lot older, okay? We've done all this stuff, you know, been there, have done that. We try to tell them something, they look at us like we are from Mars. They say thanks, but no thanks. And you know what we let them do? If you're smart, what you let them do once in a while, let them do it. I mean, I'm not trying to say put them in harm's way and make them lose their life or something like that. But if they want to do something stupid, yeah, I mean stupid, let them do it. Just go ahead and let them do it. And you know what? They'll come back and they might not tell you anything. They may not say, I wish I'd have listened or you were right. But you know what? They're not going to do it again. You know Why? Because they learned their lesson. What did we do as a parent? We watched, didn't we? We what? Hey, don't go so fast. You're going to get a ticket. Oh, oh. Nobody's going to get me. Woo, woo, woo. They get a ticket. They try to hide their ticket. Guess what we did? We have told them and told them to them, so we just fold our hands. Next time, guess what? They're going to think twice before they have to pay a $300 ticket. Why? Because we crossed arms. We let them learn their own lessons. Same thing it is with God. It says in your notes, he's not just interested in our destination. He's interested in our journey as well. And let me go back and let me pick up a couple scriptures that I just completely left out. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Sorry, Robin. 
Um, no, excuse me, Robin. Let's go to Jeremiah 29, 11. It'd be good if I got the first one, wouldn't it? For I know, I'm sorry guys, I'm so fired up tonight. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, right? That's the way he always wants us to be, as long as he's leading the parade. He says, I'm going to give you good things, not for disaster. What happens when we're the leader? Disaster. To give you a future and to give you a hope. So God wants great things out of our life. He wants to give you the best. Do you believe that? He doesn't want second best. He wants to give you the best. He wants to give you, he wants to give me a blessed, good life. Now, we can either have that blessed, good life, or we can say, I'm going to be the leader. I'm going to do this. And God says, fine, I'm going to let your plane crash. I'm going to let your, you know, it's going to rain on your parade. It's going to be a disaster. And the Lord will keep giving us disasters until we learn the lesson. All right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Do not depend on your own leadership. You have no business, I have no business, trying to be the leader. It's impossible. We don't know what's tomorrow. We don't know what's uh, in the next few, three hours here. Don't trust your own understanding. Seek his will. Let him be the leader in all that you do, and he will show you what path to take. Amen. That's what he says. That's what he'll do. But again, that's depending on you and me letting him do what he wants to do. Because we are free moral agents. That's how we have built. That's how we were wired. That's how God wanted us to be. All right? He wants us to let him lead because we want to let him lead. Proverbs 19.21 says, You can make many plans but the Lord's purpose will prevail. You and I make many plans. And because of our plans, our plans, not his, our plans, sometimes the road here gets like this. Every time the road's gone that way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that, you know what's in common? It's been our plans. Every time. Every time. God, God leaves a straight path. Always. If we acknowledge him, he leads us straight. Why? Because that is a path of blessings. All right? But when we take the controls and we go this way and this way and this way, he says, listen, I don't care how many turns you take in life. And here's the great thing about God. I don't care how many turns you take in life. You know what? My plans will, my purpose will prevail in your life. I have a purpose for your life. Now, some people, they go off the rail for five years. They go down the rail for three years, ten years, whatever it might be. People say, Pastor, can God really give me back my purpose? Yes. Can he, does he really have my purpose waiting left for me? Has he, has he not given it to somebody else? Is it still there? Yeah, it's still there. It's like having a plow in the field. All right? I'm talking about a plow, an actual plow that you use. I'm not talking about them motorized things. I'm talking about one that you put your hands on, that you use it to plow. It's tough. Sometimes you get tired and you leave the plow in the field with a row. You know, y'all listen to me now. Here's a row. Branson, my grandfather would say, get this plow. I want you to plow this road, this row. And here's how I want you to do it. And he'd always say, what y'all going to do is I'm going to put a stake all the way down there at the end. And sometimes there were long rows, long rows. I'll put a stake right there. And the reason I'm putting that stake there is because that's your mark. That's your mark. Now, I'm way over here. The stake's way over here. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to grab this, and I want you to push it. And I want you to make a, make a tunnel, make a little place for the, the, uh, the seeds and all that. I want you to make a row for me, and I want you to keep straight. And I don't want you to deviate this way or this way. I want you to go straight. And I don't want you to stop till you get the other end. You know what I found out? That's tough work. I mean, that's hard work. I mean, real hard work. If you've never worked like that in a farm thing, it's tough, folks. It's tough. Grandfather was trying to make me, a, you know, trying to ingrain a lot into me. And I thank God for him. But, you know, I can remember that there were times when I was going, when I was first starting this deal, I'd go like this and I'd go for a little bit. I say, 
and I'd leave the plow right there. I'd be gone. I'd be gone. I'd be gone doing something else. My grandfather see me three or four hours later. He says, son, I see that that plow is there in the road. And I see that you're not behind the plow. Well, I want you to know, son, the plow is exactly where you left it. I didn't touch it. Nobody else touched it. You know why? That was your row to plow. <laughs> I found out something about my grandfather. When he gave me something to do, that was my job to do. Now, he had other people that could have done that. Oh, Branson just got tired. Why don't y'all just finish up? That, you know, he's, he's a good boy. Uh-uh. Yeah. Mm. That was my row. I gave it to you. That's your row. You are responsible for that row. And if you get tired, if you quit, if you walk away, I am going to leave the stinking plow right there in the row. I'm not touching it. It's going to stay there. If you don't do it for a year, I'm not touching the stinking plow. Every time you come up at my house, it's going to be right there. Now, he's the kind of man that would have done that. I'm telling you. You, you, don't met, you didn't mess with my grandfather. I mean, he was tough as nails. I'm telling you. And when he said something, you better do it. I ain't tan you good. But you know, here's what I'm trying to say. That's the way it is when we try to do things outside of God's will. And we, we deviate from the plan. We get away from his plan. And we suffer. We have things, you know, that God allows in our life, and we deviate. Here's what God is so good at doing. When we get back in fellowship with him, when we ask him to forgive us of, of going this way and this way and this way, forgive us for letting us take on the leadership instead of allowing him to have leadership, here's what he does. He says, come here. Come here. I'm going to show you something. You remember that plow right there? Remember that was your purpose in life here? You remember, you know, I, I gave you these talents and these abilities for this purpose. You remember now, right? You remember what you were doing for me? It's right here where you left it. Nobody's touched it. Nobody's taken it away. It, 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 it's right here. Can you imagine how you feel about that? You've been there. I've been there. We are humble to the core that first of all, God forgave us of what we did because we brought shame to his name. When we have usurped authority over him and we have tried to be the leader instead of him, folks, that's a slap in God's face. We've shamed his name. We've betrayed what he wanted us to do. We've betrayed just like Judas. We might not have betrayed him like Judas did, but in other words, we did betray him. We betrayed what he wanted us to do because nobody can do what we can do. Do you understand that? Do I understand that? Nobody can do in life for Jesus what you can do. Well, there's other people can preach, not like me. There's other people that can sing, not like you. There's other people that can do this, that have these talents, not like you. There's only one you. And you can do something for God that nobody else can do, quite like you. You're unique. That's why God says, no, 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 no. I created you in your mama's womb, see? And when I did that, I gave you talents, I gave you abilities, and when you received me as Lord and Savior, I gave you this row. This row has got your name on it since the foundations of eternity. Amen. It's had your name on it right here. My row said Branson Rogers when God put me in my mom's belly, and he formed me. And when I became a Christian at eight years old, he revealed that road to me. Even as a little kid, I can remember. He told me, what you need to do is you need to tell other kids about Jesus. I went home that night, and I told one of my friends about Jesus. And I started to do things as the Lord was telling me to do things. And then he revealed to me that you're supposed to be a pastor. He gave me a row. That's my row. And I've strayed here, 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 here. But God has forgiven me. He's brought me back and said, Branson, the plow is still here. Grab a hold of it. Come on. Let's get going again. Isn't that wonderful? He never gives up on us, folks. Other people may give up on you. 
Other people will say you're a disaster. Other people will say you're a has-been or you've done this, you've gone too far, you've done this. I, I've heard it all. But I'm going to tell you something. You'll never hear those words out of God's mouth. I don't care what you do. Pastor, I've gone off the rail. You don't believe what I've done. Listen, God knows what we've done, and God gets us. Do you understand that? He gets us because he was tempted in all ways like we were. Yes, he was God, but he knows what we go through. Don't say, hey, God, I'm a superman. No, you're not a superman. You got crimped tonight. Everybody's got crimped tonight. He said, he's not interested in your destination, he's interested in your journey as well. Moment by moment, he wants us to have complete dependency upon him. But that means that we have to make sure our attention is not divided. Have you ever talked to somebody, you've gone to somebody, okay? Okay, say I'm over here and I'm talking to Pat. I'm talking to Pat right now, okay? When I'm talking to Pat right now, guess what Pat's doing? Pat's looking at me. Okay, he's looking at me. I know it's tough, but he's looking at me. Now, I've talked to other people, and I start talking to them, and here's what they do. You ever talk to somebody like that? Does it look like they're paying attention to you? Does it look like they even care about even talking to you? Does it look like to you that they don't even want you to be around them? Listen. Another old thing that you find, if somebody's not going to look at you in their eyes when you're talking to them, they're not really interested in what you've got to say, exactly. right? If you want to come to me, you come to me as pastor, I've got a problem. And I'm sitting here going, mm -hmm, playing on my computer, looking at my phone, uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, you, know, you say, what's the use? He's not interested in what I'm saying. Or it's like if you call me on the phone, pastor. Hey, I need to talk to you. I'm sitting here, and you can hear me in the back. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. You'd say, what's this? I'm not calling him anymore. He's doing all these other things. He's not even concerned about it. What am I doing? I'm showing you that I don't really care. If, you, if we are not looking at God, if he doesn't have our complete focus, you know what we're telling him? We're not really interested in following what you've got to say. He wants our undivided attention. Yes, sir. Amen. That's what he wants. You say, that is tough. Yeah, it is. It's the hardest thing you and I will ever do. You know why? Because we got everything, as I told you about in that series, Table for Two, we got everything around us trying to get our attention. God says there's only way that, one way that I can be the leader. And that is that you give me your undivided attention. You've got to follow me. And to follow me, you've got to look at me. You've got to, you've got to get where I'm going, right? The Bible says that Enoch, he walked with God. He walked with God. What does that mean? If I say, hey, come out and walk with me. Walking with me means walking with me. It means walking in step with me. If I take a step, you take a step. You know, you, you, that's how you do it. If I stop, you stop, right? Does some of y'all know how to walk? I'm trying to get a good illustration here, all right? Enoch walked with God. That means that Enoch was in fellowship, in a relationship with his Savior, right? His God, all right? So he was walking in step. He cared enough about it. God being the leader that he says, I don't want to be out of step with my God, so I better keep up with him. He walked with God. That's a powerful statement. Some people just read it by and they say, oh, he not walked with God. No, no, no. Time out. That's a big deal. If we walk with God, that means we're walking with him in step. If he stops, it's a caution light for us. We need to stop. We need to be still and know that he's God. We don't need to go ahead of him. We don't need to go take steps back. We need to stop. Because he says, hold on. Hold on a minute. There's something right here. You need to wait. Right? God answers our prayers in three ways. He's either going to give you a green light, and that means go. He's going to give you a yellow, and that means be still and know that he's God. 
Don't go back. Don't go forward. Put yourself in neutral. Don't do anything. Or he's going to give you a dead red. When he gives a dead red, that's going to be, you do not have peace in your heart that this is right. How do you know, pastor? How do you personally know as a pastor whether it's God's will to do something or not? Here's how I know it. I pray about things. I say, God, if it's your will, give me a green. No checks in my spirit. If it's not right, check, 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 check in my spirit. Even though I want to do it, check in my spirit. I know it isn't right. I said to Brian just a couple of days ago, I said, I was praying about something, Brian. And Brian felt one way, and I didn't know that he felt the way that I was feeling. But originally, I didn't feel the way Brian was feeling, but I didn't know how he was tending. But I had a check in my spirit. And I said, Brian, I said, we were talking about it, and I said, I have a check in my spirit about this. He just looked at me and smiled. He said, I'm glad you did because I had the same check in my spirit. What did that mean? If I'd have gone ahead with that or hadn't even consulted Brian or whatever, you know, I'd have done something I shouldn't have done. You know, the Lord said I'd have stepped on a landmine. All right. So that's how you do it. But he says, I'm not interested just in your destination. I'm interested in staying with you in your journey. God's goal for us isn't just to end up at the right place. His goal for us is to have a relationship with him. All right? It'd be like if I said to you, hey, why don't you go to Atlanta Braves game with me? Would you like to go? Yeah. I'll go. All right. Tell you what. We're going to go to Atlanta, and we're going to watch the game. So I'll see you when you get there. I take my way, you take your way. We meet for the game. We have a hot dog together. We have a Coke. Maybe get some peanuts. Enjoy the game. See you later. You get up. You go this way. I go this way. We arrived at the same destination, but we didn't have a a real relationship, did we? We didn't have real fellowship, right? We're all going to heaven if we know Jesus. That's our destination, He cares a lot about that, and we're very thankful that we're heading that way. We know our destination, but you know what? He wants us to have a relationship with him along the way. And so many Christians say, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole, but they don't consult him the rest of their journey. Folks, that's not what he wants. He's not as much concerned. He is concerned about our destination, of course, but he wants to have a relationship with us along the way. Why? He craves your love. Are you listening to me? Well, pastor, that's stupid. Look at all the people around that love him. Love? Come on. You just said, I don't know how many millions of people are probably Christians. Look at all those people loving him. No. They don't all love him the way they ought to. They don't. They don't all love him the way they ought to. How many Christians are really dedicated to praying to the Lord every day, reading the Bible every day, consulting him, letting him be the leader, and then letting him control everything, and then being in perfect fellowship, and then walking with God like Enoch walked with God? How many? What kind of percentage? Very, 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 very low. When Jesus, when God got down in that garden, and he was looking for Adam and Eve, you know, it broke his heart. Because he created them for fellowship. He created them for for love. He wants to love on us. If you went weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and your kid never called you on the phone, never reached out to you and act like you didn't even exist, would that not hurt your heart? Sure it would. Do you think it not hurts God's heart when his, his children don't consult him about things? Sure it does. Do you think it hurts God's heart when we we don't read the directions and we think we can just make life as we want to make it or we don't ask him in prayer? Only time we come to prayer is when we want something. Like our kids, the only time they come to us sometimes is when they want something. You ever listen to your kids? Do you have kids? Do you know what I'm talking about? I can tell. I'm not ragging on my kids, okay? But I can tell. 
in the first, mm, let's see, 90 seconds, or maybe sooner, of what the call's all about. Dad, nice weather today. Hmm. Dad, have you had a tough day? Huh? Hey, Dad, um, you know it's uh, been kind of tough around. Here we go. Hey, Dad, uh, can we, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. If that was the only phone call I got in six months, or if I got ten calls in six months and all those phone calls were for Dad, can you give me this, Dad, can you give me this, Dad, what would I think? They're treating me like a vending machine. Right? Same way it is with God. Same way it is with God. So many Christians, oh, I pray, Pastor. God, you know, I'm in a tight spot. I, I, need, a, I need a miracle. And then we get mad and we say, you know what? Pastor says we're always supposed to pray, and he didn't answer my prayer. Well, guess what? He was tired of you pushing the vending machine buttons. He actually wants you to say something else to him other than gimme, 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 gimme. It says in your notes, surrender is a sign of weakness. And when we are weak, he's strong. We don't want to surrender our title of being the leader. We don't like to give up the, the towel. We don't like to throw it to wave, wave the white flag. You know the greatest strength, the strongest person in this audience or somebody watching or somebody at the Point Church, the strongest person in here is a person that surrenders every single day. That's the strongest person. What are you saying? Wave the flag, baby. Best thing we can do as a Christian is to wave the white flag every single morning when we get up. And we need to say, I'm surrendering to your lordship. I'm surrendering to your decisions. I'm just surrendering to your will. I'm surrendering. I do not want to do anything at all to run my life. I'm giving it all to you. I surrender. That goes completely against what this world would have to say. Everybody says, surrender. Are you kidding? I'll never surrender. I'm a baby. Listen, when we're weak, he's strong. When we think we're strong, we're weak. Amen? The Bible says, let him be the leader. Let him be strong. But for him to be strong, we have to be weak. We have to take the back seat. Following the leader is all about baby steps. It's like our children, when we had our kids, they crawl for months, okay? Then they put the arm up on their chair, all right? They're ready to take their first step. Then they just stand there and they laugh, remember? Stand there and laugh. And then we start bribing our kids. After they stand there and they're, we start bribing them. We have these little, you know, things for them to eat. We say, hey, if you'll take another step, I'll give you this. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. We start bribing them. We start, those kids start taking those, those little steps. Why? Because crawling comes natural to a baby. That's what they do. The Lord's trying to get us to walk out of our comfort zone. That's what he's trying to get us to do. We're only so comfortable sometimes about giving God so much control in our life. And then for us to give him more control of our life takes one word. F-A-I-T-H. Peter had followed the Lord so far, okay? But then when the Lord was over here and he said, Peter, come here. He was in the water. And he had to walk on the water. The Lord was trying to get him and said, have you crawled long enough? What I want you to do now, I want you to, I want you to start walking. Let's do some water walking. Never had been done. Faith got him out of the boat. The others that were in the boat, they didn't get up. They didn't do nothing. But Peter had enough faith to get up, stop crawling, and start walking. That's what the Lord wants us to do. But it's what we've done. We've given the Lord so much in our life. Okay, that's great. But now we've 
matured a little bit in Christianity. Now the Lord says, okay, that's enough crawling over here. What I need you to do is I need you to start walking from here to here. But in order to do that, you're going to have to really trust me. You're going to have to have faith in me. All right? Do you remember? And I remember, and I've used this illustration before, of my little girl, Rachel. She's up on the, what called monkey bars. I don't know if that's politically correct to say that anymore, but I just said it. All right? On the jungle gym monkey bars, going like this. When you're a little kid, you're about like that. Then monkey bars seem like they're a thousand feet up in the air, right? Yeah. I had Rachel over here, and I was standing over here on the other. And I said, "Honey, what you need to do is you put one hand here, uh, next hand, next hand, next hand." I figured out she wasn't gonna go nowhere until I came over here. And I stood so I was able to grab her if she fell. What I was trying to do is to teach my little girl, all right, baby, listen, you've looked at this thing long enough. You've wondered how it would be to go from here to here long enough. You've, let, you've looked at this thing in awe. That's a mountain right there that you need to climb. So here's what I'm going to do. That's enough crawling let's go ahead and conquer this mountain. And what I'm going to do is, you're going to have to do it, get up there, and you're going to have to have enough faith to put one here, one here, one here, one here. But I want you to know, I'm not asking you to do this, or you're not going to be doing this without my protection. I'm going to be here because I'm your daddy. Y'all see where I'm going with this? That's the same way it is with faith. We get up there and we said, okay, I want you to trust me a little bit more about being the leader in your life. Here's a big decision. Here's an impossibility that you think is an impossibility, and God has given you a green light. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to sit back and say, I can't do this? No. We need to follow his lead and know, and listen now, listen, listen. God will not give you a green light that he's not on the other side of that green light. Are you listening? He will never lead where he will not protect, where he will not be there to help us in our, in our decision. But it's up to us to step out, quit crawling, and conquer the mountains, one mountain after another mountain after another mountain. That's what the Christian life is all about. Amen. How many times have we stood on something and we said, there's no way I can ever do that? I'm not smart enough to pass that test. I'm not smart enough to do this. I don't have the ability to do this. There's no way that deal's going to ever come through. There's no way this is going to happen. This is going to happen. We've stood there. God's given us a green light. You know what we've done? We've honored God. We stepped out. And now we look back and we say, I can remember that time. You know what the Lord said? Aren't you glad that you stood up and Quit crawling and followed me and had faith in me enough to conquer what you just conquered. Amen. But that's only as good as our next little mountain that comes up. The life of a Christian is continually to stand up, conquer. Stand up, conquer. All the different things he has. Following the leader is all about baby steps. It doesn't happen overnight. Learning to walk physically or spiritually takes time. It's a process that involves many setbacks. When you first took your first step or when I first took mine, guess what we did after that? We fell. What did we do after that? I got back up. What did we do after that? I fell. What did we do after that? I back up. When we're an adult, or even when you're a teenager, we have to make our mind up to get up. Amen? Amen? Quit sitting there, laying there after you fall down and start wallowing in your own depression and your old self-misery. You know people and I know people that are like that every time you're around them. You know why? Because they don't have, if they're a Christian, they don't have enough faith in God that God can get them out of what they're in. They are letting their circumstances, their situations, 
their bad decisions, their bad choices to define who they are. And that is not God's will. It's like I told those kids Monday night. Listen, don't say to me that I didn't, I was raised in a single parent or I didn't have parents or this culture is this way and this culture, everybody around me is a drug dealer. Everybody around me is, is an alcoholic. Everybody's this way and this way and this way. So that's the way I am. No, let me tell you something. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. It don't make no difference how many drug addicts are around you. It don't make any difference what kind of parenting you had or lack of. It doesn't make any difference how many alcoholics around you. It doesn't make any difference what the culture is around you. They can all be gangbangers. What are you going to be, a gangbanger just because everybody else is? Or are you going to get up and be who God wants you to be? This culture has a hard time of understanding that. It really does. So that's what I share with those kids. Our pursuit of character has never, was never intended to be a solo flight. Being all you can be isn't going to cut it. Our motto as Christians ought to be, and I kind of put this down, when you can't, he can. When you can't, he can. Amen. Old Dr. Watson used to be president of Trinity College. Love that old man. I uh, wouldn't be where I am tonight without his influence in my life. And he was a great mentor to Billy Graham. Knew Billy Graham so well. And uh, me and him had a special, special relationship that God just gave to me. And, you know, I could still, still hear that old man sing. And uh, he couldn't sing a lick. Honestly, terrible singer. But I can remember he get in the pulpit and start of the new year in college. He would always sing the little chorus, He's Able. If you don't know that little chorus, you need to look it up. And it kind of goes like this, and I ain't going to sing it because I'm a worse singer than he was. It goes, He's able, He's able. I know he's able. I know he's able to carry me through. He healed the brokenhearted. He set the captives free. He made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. He's able. He's able. I know he's able. I know he's able to carry me through. Dr. Watson was the greatest man of faith I've ever known in my whole entire life. That man could pray like nobody else could pray. I'm serious with y'all. He could pray heaven down. Never heard anybody like him. Never will. A man of faith. And he'd always say, walk in the halls at the school. He'd come up to him and say, how you doing today, Branson? Doc, I got something going on in my life. Well, he's able, son. And he'd take my hand. He'd pray for me right on the spot. He didn't ever say to you, well, I'll pray for you. He said, dear Jesus, right now, I pray that you would just intervene in this young man's life. I mean, telling you. Telling you now. He was from Lumberton, North Carolina. You don't mess it in. He was an old backwoods country man. Used to pre preach in tent meetings, man, the sawdust trails. Whew. But I remember that old man. Every time old devil tries to get me down, I remember. He's able, Branson. Remember, remember that boy? And I'll say the same to you. He's able. Follow the leadership of the Lord and always, always know that no matter what he, you come up upon in life, as long as he's leading, as long as he gives you the green light, have faith and know that he's able. Amen. He is able to carry you and me through. Our Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your word this evening. Lord, just a simple, simple message, nothing complex. 
But, Lord, something that we really need to understand. It's a really, really divine principle, Lord. And I pray that all of us have understood it, Lord, and not only just understood it, but we put it to work in our life, Lord. Not just being hearers, but be doers. And, Lord, just to continue to bless us and use us for your glory and your honor, Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I um, love preaching to you tonight, and next week we will... Uh, let's see, Brian's going to be in here next week. He's going to be covering for me. So uh, Brian is actually going to be preaching for me on Sunday. Um, and uh, I know who's here right now. And uh, if I look at the cameras Sunday and I see that you're not present, I'm going to know. I don't usually announce when I'm leaving, but uh, I will announce because I know y'all are mature Christians. And I know that everybody will be here. Well, Pastor's not there today, so I'm not going to go. No, you give Brian your support. He's all excited about preaching for y'all. He really is. And uh, so I'm really happy to have him preach. And, and then he'll be having the message with y'all next week in here. He's going to let Trish handle his class back there. I am going to the mountains to kind of refresh, regenerate a little bit, and uh, get up there. Still in the high 40s up there where I'm going, so I'm looking forward to it. So be gone for about a week or so. If you need anything while I'm gone, just go ahead and give Pastor Brian a holler. You can holler at me, too, if you want to, and uh, I'll holler back at you when I get a chance. You know, between uh, eating barbecue and drinking some cider, I'll, I'll call you back when I get a chance. But love y'all. Appreciate y'all being here, and uh, y'all have an awesome week. And Pastor Brian will see you again on Sunday. Amen? Amen. All right. God bless y'all.